to welcome all of you to worship here at the Congregational Church of Brookfield and let you know that no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. And in a spirit of welcome, if our ushers would pass the pew registers among us, we could sign in. Um, and I, I wanted to extend a special welcome today to John LaFleur, who is our guest organist today. Thank you so much for that beautiful uh, prelude. Um, are there other announcements? Then let us center our hearts in a time of prayer as we listen now to the tolling of our church bell. Will you join with me now in our responsive call to worship? We come here today to find a broad welcome in this place of healing and hope. We come to hear God's words that inspire and challenge. We are offered holy hospitality that teaches us to open our lives to others. We are reminded that when we welcome others, we may just be welcoming angels. We come to learn to live fully with open minds, open hearts, open tables, and open doors. We come to learn from the example of Jesus and to worship God together. and prayer of approach, let us pray. Holy One, we know the stories of miracles, of storms calmed, illnesses healed, and life restored, and yet there are times when we struggle to trust or believe. You call us to step out of our comfort zones, 
but we would prefer to stay inside where we think it is safe. You provide us partners for the journey, but we have difficulty getting along or finding common ground. You say that we need only the clothes on our backs, but we pack our cars, luggage, and homes full of things we don't need and lament the things we wish we had. You tell us to accept hospitality, but we don't want to put anyone out. In this time and place, help us to see the beauty and wisdom in following the example of Jesus and his disciples as they received hospitality and offered welcome, healing, and hope to so many. Send your spirit upon us that we too might have the courage and grace to share your life-changing and restorative good news and love with the world. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus, our example and guide, who taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. stuff over here? You know, there's a lot of stuff, right? What does it look like it might be? Stuff you pack for vacation. Yeah, stuff you pack for vacation. All the things we think we need to go do anything and make a difference, right? So we have a couple people here who are going to go on a trip for us. They're a buddy, team of two, okay? So Jesus told us to go out in teams of two. So they're all ready. So I've got a lot of stuff because you've got to have stuff when you go out and take a trip and, you know, do anything. So let's see. What do you think we need for the trip? We've got to have extra clothes, right? So here's a whole suitcase of clothes for you, and here's a suitcase of clothes for you. Now, I think, is it okay if they go up here? Is that okay? So you guys can go up here. Just stay away from the candles. Okay, so you've got that. Okay, oh, 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 but we forgot the backpack. This has your lunch and some extra stuff because we need stuff. And here, Amanda, here you got stuff. Oh, and here's, oh, travel pillow. You just never know when you need a little comfort. Okay, there you go. Sasha, here's a travel pillow just because you never, you've got to be prepared. You can't do anything good unless you have the stuff. Okay, uh, umbrella just in case it rains. Here, okay, got it. Are you, are you feeling really prepared for anything? Here you go. Oh, more. Okay. Oh, wait. Did you wait? Oh, I forgot water. Here, you gotta have your water. Oh, oh, water. Oh, here. Okay. Are you feeling so prepared? Are you really like able to go do stuff? Here. Oh, sunglasses. Just because you know you don't ever know if it's gonna rain or it's gonna go. Yep. Wow. <laughs> oh, bug spray. Bug spray. Okay. You just never know. Okay. Oh, money. You gotta have your money because you just never know. You just have to have your stuff. You gotta share that. Okay, oh, and here's a walk. <laughs> here's a walking stick. Okay, now can you guys just go and have a, have a fun time? Go see ya. See. <laughs> wait, oh, wait, you, you can't? You can't go? Wait, I think there was a, was there a note here somewhere? Oh, this is a note. This is a little note from Jesus. He said, oh, teams of two. You're going to go out and help people in the neighboring towns. You may take along a walking stick, but don't carry any money. I'm going to, I'm going to kind of adjust this a little bit. Um, no bug spray, no water, no travel pillows, no umbrellas. 
This is my own little addition. Okay. <laughs> These are not the red letters of Jesus. <laughs> okay. So you don't need this. Okay. No sunglasses. So you have, let me just read it again. Okay. You may take along a walking stick, but don't carry any money. It's all right to wear sandals, but don't take even a change of clothes. <laughs> so now, okay, so go. Are you ready? <laughs> do you feel more prepared now? Less prepared? What do you think? I don't feel as much prepared without all my stuff. Why do you think Jesus told us to just take a stick and sandals? Any ideas? No idea? Why do you think? Okay, I'll help. Okay, so you guys want to sit down? You can sit down. Okay. All right. So now Jesus wants us, like, right, we've got to be prepared for anything. That's the way we always think, right? So, but he said, right, he had a plan, and he's a pretty clever guy, and he does things all the time that are like surprises to us. We think it should be one way, and then he says, no, it's the other way, right? He said, don't bring anything. And why do you think? We're going to go meet people. So if we went with all that stuff to meet people, do you think anybody would think they maybe had anything to share with us? Because we had everything. We knew it all, right? We knew exactly how to be. We were ready for everything. But if we didn't have those things, I think Jesus was saying, go into that town and meet people and connect with them and let them know that you need some help and they need help too. And that's a way you can share and meet people. And so he wanted to create trust between the apostles, those are Jesus' friends, and the towns and the communities that they entered by having them work together. He was teaching them and us that it's okay and even good to rely on each other for the things that we need and to be ready to share when we have more than we need. So I think I might go somewhere in the middle. <laughs> So, okay, we're going to say a quick prayer, and then we're going to follow Mrs. Crandall to Sunday school, okay? So, all right. Dear God, you give us good gifts and all this stuff, sometimes more than we need or even know how to use. Teach us, like Jesus does, to share with others when we have too much, and also to depend and to rely on others and to help us to remember to ask for help when we need it. Amen.
Dear Lord, help us as we hear these scriptures together. Come bring your understanding and reveal your truth. Come open our minds, hearts, and souls to all these words of life that you offer us. Amen. This morning's scripture reading is from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 6, verses 1 through 13. He left that place and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. On the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astounded. They said, where did this man get all this? What is this wisdom that has been given to him? What deeds of power are being done by his hand? Is not this the carpenter, son of Mary, and brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? Are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Then Jesus said to them, Prophets are not without honor, except in their hometown, and among their own kin, and in their own house. And he could not do deed of power there, except that he laid hands on a few sick people and cured them. And he was amazed at their unbelief. Then he went about among the villages teaching. He called the twelve and began to send them out two by two, and gave them authority over unclean spirits. He offered them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts but to wear sandals and not put on two tunics. He said to them, Wherever you enter a house, stay there until you leave the place. If any place will not welcome you, and they refuse to hear you, as you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed that all should repent. They cast out many demons, and anointed with oil many who were sick and cured them. May God add a blessing to the understanding of these holy words. Amen. Friends, will you pray with me for just a moment? Holy One, help us to be still, to be still and know that you are God and that you are here present among us. Settle in us all that is unsettled so that we might truly open ourselves up, hearts, minds, lives to the word that you have for each of us this morning. Amen. So have you ever had someone in your life say something like, oh, that Jennifer, I knew her when she was this big. All the stories I could tell. We joke about this often enough when the occasion presents itself, but it really is different when it happens in one of those key moments in your life, when you need to be a real grown up and claim your authority, when you are in the classroom or the boardroom or the pulpit, perhaps. I remember the first time that I tried to preach in my home church. I was invited back to share something in the church where I had grown up. And to be quite honest, it was a stinker of a sermon. There's no question about it. And yet all of the people there were just so kind. They were so nice because they knew me when. And they were willing to accept any garbage that I apparently fed to them from the pulpit that morning. As our scripture opens for today, the situation that Jesus is facing is kind of similar. He is preaching back in the synagogue in his hometown, and at first people are amazed because he apparently seems to know what he's talking about, at least a little bit. And yet he's also making these new points that they perhaps had never heard before, about bringing freedom to the oppressed, releasing the captives, and that God's love was not just for the best and most able rule followers, but for all people, even the sinners and tax collectors he now had in his band of merry men that were following him. 
At first, the people are amazed, but then something changes. Perhaps it was that images of Jesus as a young boy causing a ruckus in the streets started to flash in their memories. Or they remembered little Jesus sitting in the back pew of the synagogue, giggling and laughing it up with all of his friends. Perhaps it was that they weren't sure what to do with the fact that they knew this young man, who was now not so young, and were straight up confused about how a humble carpenter had become a prophet. Or perhaps it was that they were really listening that day. They were listening to Jesus' message, and as it sunk in, they realized that it called them to do something. To turn or to turn back to God's ways, to make a change in the way they were living, to be a part of the solution for those people whom Jesus preached about instead of just going about life as usual. And so they started to complain. Who does he think he is, they asked. They disparaged him. Isn't this Mary's son? Because apparently referencing someone's mother was the ultimate put down in a male dominated society. There is no mention of Jesus as the son of Joseph or even more outlandish still as the son of God. They have a total we knew him when moment and they refuse to accept the authority that Jesus was claiming that day for himself. They basically run him out of town with only the opportunity to help heal a few people, perhaps those few who are willing to accept the message that he had to offer, who wanted and were willing to have something change. And at the end of this part of the scripture, it is Jesus who is amazed, amazed at the unbelief of the people whom he had grown up around, those who perhaps should have known him best and supported him and believed him because of it. But they didn't. So off Jesus and his disciples went. <clears throat> now let's take a moment to consider the disciples here. Can you imagine what they were thinking in that moment? They had left everything to follow this guy. And now the people in his hometown won't even accept him. But unlike the people in Jesus's hometown, they had proof on their side. The disciples had been there with Jesus since chapter one. They were present to witness healings, the driving out of demons, the preaching of awesome sermons that woke people and made them consider what it would mean to follow God through the teaching and example of Jesus. There must have been something in what he was talking about that made them want to drop everything and to keep on following. So what happens next must have been really interesting for the disciples. They had witnessed Jesus being run out of his hometown for preaching the good news, for sharing a message that was anti this world and its systems of government that people found themselves perishing under, separated out and oppressed by. And then Jesus says to them, okay, now it's your turn. Go ahead, go out there and do that thing that I've been doing. And then, as Amy so eloquently shared in her time for children, he gives them this laundry list of what it is that they are supposed to bring or not bring to go out and share the good news. Go out two by two, but don't bring anything. You are equipment enough for the work of God. Accept hospitality from people, and if someone turns you away, then shake the dust of their place off of your feet as a testimony against them and their unwillingness to welcome you. Note that Jesus doesn't actually tell them anything about their mission. He doesn't say, this is what you're supposed to say, this is what you're supposed to do, this is what you're supposed to preach. He only tells them not to bring a change of clothes and to go out into the world. But we get the picture. Because a little while on in that scripture, it says, so they went out and proclaimed that all should repent, turn back toward God. They cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and cured them. Jesus, not so successful with his mission at the beginning of this chapter. The disciples, on the other hand, success. So what's the difference? And what connects these two pieces of our story today? As I thought and reflected on this answer, that the one that came to me 
was that it was all about hospitality. Hospitality was the difference. While you would think that Jesus would have been welcomed back in the town where he had grown, it seemed that there was no welcome for him there, no hospitality offered. Like the beginning of his life where all of the signs on the inn said no vacancy, it seems that was the answer that he got when he wandered back into the town of his youth. Unlike a famous sports star coming home to a ticker tape parade, Jesus was run out instead. Prophets are not without honor, he says, except in their hometown. But there was no way that the disciples would have been successful in any of this. They wouldn't have had a shot at casting out demons, healing people, sharing the good news, and inviting people to turn toward God without the hospitality of those where they landed. And while we all know people, and I am looking at a number of them sitting in this room this morning, Lord love them who can throw an amazing dinner party, whose tools are crockpots and tablecloths and matching candlesticks, and I bless you all for that, because that is not my forte. We had people come to our house last weekend, and it was, I was lucky to get the toilets and the dishes cleaned. <laughs> so there you go. That's not the kind of hospitality that we're talking about in this story. The kind of hospitality that was required of people in the time and place in which Jesus was ministering was more radical than that. The host of a stranger guest was to be sure that their guests' feet were cleansed and oiled, both to soften them and to make them not stink quite as much after a long journey, to give them food and drink, to offer them shelter and companionship, and to provide them with security, to be sure that they were safe while they were under the host's care. The host, that radically hospitable one, was to be chief cook and bottle washer, servant and security force for people that they didn't know at all. And in the case of those disciples, they had to do it for two people at a time. Because you see, Jesus' strategic plan required that the disciples went out two by two for any number of reasons. Perhaps it was to be sure that they were safe or so they had someone to back up their stories. They couldn't tell fish tales if they had someone along with them. Perhaps it was so they always had someone to encourage them or someone who balanced their gifts for ministry. As we know, doing the work that we do in community around here, in fellowship, teaching, mission, and care, we don't do this work alone. It doesn't feel as good or work as well when we try to. And Jesus knew that. And so he sent out his disciples as partners to minister to people around the area where his ministry began to go to the ends of the known world as they knew it, and to spread God's love and light, to offer words of hope to the hopeless, to offer words of healing to the hurt, to offer words of blessing to those who felt less than, to unite people behind a common cause and around common issues, to ignite their faith. And in order for that to happen, we know that that radical hospitality was the key. They needed food and a place to live. They needed to be clean and kept safe. They needed a home. And who knows why these stranger hosts did this? Who knows why they did it? And who knows why they thought it was a sane thing to offer that kind of true hospitality for people they didn't know? But no matter the answer to those questions, they did it anyway. And in doing so, we can presume that their lives were changed. Because it's hard to have someone living under your roof and not get to know them. Not to have an opportunity to find out what they have to share and offer. We can benefit greatly from opening up hearts, minds, doors, and letting people in and by hearing the stories of other people. And every time I think of this kind of hospitality, I am reminded of that scripture from Hebrews that says, that when we offer hospitality to strangers, we may just be welcoming angels without knowing it. I think of this when I think of things like our refugee resettlement ministry in the midst of wars raging in the Middle East and stereotypes flying about Iraqis, Syrians, and Muslims in general. We have been blessed to welcome into this home amazing families who have taught us much about love, faith, fighting for what is right, and welcoming others. There's so much to be learned 
when we offer radical hospitality, when we welcome others among us and are reminded to follow God's ways in doing so. True hospitality, the kind that means that we learn to treat others as we wish to be treated, that teaches us about those who are deemed other in a way that expands our horizons and doesn't scare us, that helps us to reach out to, to and offer freedom to the captives, offers strength and opportunity for the oppressed, and brings good news to our communities and to the world. That is the kind of hospitality that we are called to as Christians. Just as Jesus called his disciples to go out on a mission of hope and love and justice millennia ago, Jesus calls us, his disciples today, to do the same. We are called to speak up and speak out, to welcome and to provide space to learn and grow, to come to the aid of those who are in danger or who are having difficulty and help keep them safe, to discern God's wisdom and to share God's love. We are called beyond the things of this world to a higher calling. We are called not to say we knew Jesus when, but rather to acknowledge that we know Jesus now. And we are called to follow him beyond the walls of this church, even to the ends of the earth as we know it now, ministering, speaking, acting, and loving in his name. May it be so. Amen. So our preparation... Okay, I just was worried. <laughs> Our preparation for prayer today is one that we've done often outside at the outdoor chapel. Um, it's the love round, and um, I think we're going to lead it and sing it in two parts. Is that right? Yeah, so our plan is we're going to sing it all the way through once together, and then um, we'll sing it in a round twice. So a um, As we enter into our time of prayer, I would draw your attention to the names on the back of your bulletin, um, many of whom we've been play praying for for a while. Um, as I was um, coming into worship at 8.30, um, someone lifted up a prayer concern, um, particularly for those um, rescuers going um, out to bring the boys back from the Thailand cave, and they said that at least three of them have been uh, brought back safely, so we continue to pray for them. Um, I would invite your prayers for the victims of flooding and mudslides in Japan, especially as my daughter leaves for Japan tomorrow to that area, so um, let's um, hold them in our prayers. Also, those um, who are fighting the wildfires in the Southwest, um, the uh, word came through one of our Boy Scouts that Philmont actually had to close the Boy Scout camp. They lost something like 27,000 acres um, of that very precious land um, for our National Boy Scout camp. And um, also for our friends and neighbors in the Santa Barbara United Church of Christ that is pastored by Alyssa DeWolf, um, they've evacuated something like 2,500 homes in the Santa Barbara area, so our, our love is with them. Um, and of course, uh, our prayers are with those who are working for positive change and for peace, um, our, all of our world leaders, and um, those especially working at the border on immigration reform and 
helping to reunite children with their parents um, after being separated at the border. Um, we also are praying for many of our own uh, congregation who are grieving the loss of loved ones this spring. Um, also for Jennifer, um, our special prayers for you, Jen, as you enter into your last week of preparation for the mission trip. Um, by this time next week, they'll already be off on their mission trip, so we invite your prayers for that whole group. Is anyone here? What? Oh, I, I thought you were objecting to that. Aren't you all leaving? Aren't you? Aren't you? Aren't you? Are you? You're leaving on Saturday, right? And we leave very early on Sunday. Okay, very early on Sunday morning. Yeah, not a lot of sleep that night, though. Um, so are there, are there those who are going on the mission trip? Would you stand if you're going? You're going, Pete, aren't you? No, Maurice. 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 Okay. So we're praying particularly for you guys as, as you support that mission group. Um, also, we got some. Uh, we were are gonna pray for our uh, Vacation Bible School teachers and leaders. Who who is a volunteer at Vacation Bible School? Will you all stand if you're one? Carol. Carol's working in the kitchen. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll be we'll be praying for you today. For whom else uh, shall we be in prayer? Did I miss somebody? Yeah. Um, I wanted to just lift up a really quick joy. So um, my brother happens to be here today, and um, he offered his backyard for my sermon writing space for this week, and he didn't walk out as I was preaching. Um, so, <laughs> so we'll accept that as a joy. Uh, but also, one of the ways that he puts his faith into action is through, um, it, he works with his issue of passion, which is veterans and veterans issues. And on this week following the 4th of July, um, I just wish to lift him up and all of the wonderful work that he does. Um, in those areas too so I think it's a God is still laughing moment that she got to preach about like her hometown and, <laughs> and he showed up in church. you showed up in church well done <laughs> don't don't run her out of the parking lot well let us unite our hearts in prayer holy and gracious God we are so grateful for your call to love and share with others but also for the opportunities you provide for us to offer our own vulnerability, to allow others to care for us. We thank you that we can worship in our free nation in this meeting house for the sacrifices of others that they have made so that can happen. We are asking for your help today to trust in your extravagant grace and abundant love. For there are many issues in our world and in our own lives that cause us stress and worry. We're grateful that within it all, you are here with us, that you promise your presence with us always, whether in this life or in the next. We give you thanks, especially for giving us companions for the journey. Grant us wisdom and courage, we pray, as we continue in the work of discipleship, your work for justice and peace. Guide us, we pray, in ways that we can reach out to those who are most in need of your care. As we feed the hungry or care for the sick or welcome the stranger with love and true hospitality, may we be blessed by your grace as by the angels themselves. <coughs> For we offer it all in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. So we have this opportunity to share now as we are able. So I invite you to give to this morning's offering with joyful hearts. Yeah. <laughs> 
me now in our offertory prayer. Generous God, you provide for us beyond our imagining. You offer us food for hearts, minds, souls, and bodies. You offer us companions for the journey. You offer us welcome and call us beloved. Help us not only to accept these gifts with grace, but also to give generously. Help us share especially with those who are crushed by the things of this world and to bring hope and healing where it is needed most through these gifts we offer back today. Bless these offerings and bless all that can be accomplished through them in your name. Amen. between and among us until we meet again. Amen. And now, friends, blessed by the peace of Christ, let us offer a sign of that peace to one another and especially bring those signs of peace out into the world. The peace of Christ be with you all. You just praise the Lord. 